Well, hello and happy Wednesday afternoon. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm the outreach coordinator here at Pasadena Humane. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, if not, welcome back. Today, we are joined by Quinn. How are you today, Quinn? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Quinn is uh, one of Pasadena Humane Behavior Specialists and Trainers. Um, and so she's got a bunch of uh, tips and tricks for all of uh, the critters in our lives. Um, all the critters. This, all you know, the for me, <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, Quinn, this would have been good a couple of years ago because at one time in my life I had um, cockatiels and um, I've had leopard geckos. So, yeah. and I think my sister actually had hamsters at one point too. Um, and my best friend grew up with bunnies. Oh yeah, all, you got all the critters there. <laughs> you got all the big ones. Yeah, all, all of them. Ones. So I'm really <laughs> excited to hear what it is you have to share with us today. Um, before we do get started though, I'm gonna go over some webinar reminders for our new friends today. So guys, bear with me while I show you my screen. All right, so like I said, these are webinar reminders. Um, these webinars are audio and visual. So even though you can see and hear Quinn and I, we can't see and hear you. Um, if you have a question, try not to raise your hand because we're not in school, um, but you can use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. If you can, save your questions until the end. Um, Quinn may get to them, although the presentation is um, very uh, what species specific. Um, the words escaped my mind for a moment. So if you have a question about a specific animal, you can go ahead and ask that at the end of that portion. Um, so, as I was saying, today we are talking about enrichment with your critters. So, we're going to talk about bunnies and guinea pigs and hamsters, and we've thrown some birds in there as well as reptiles. Um, next month, we're going to be talking with Carol Mims of Pet Porter Pals on pet emergency preparedness. Um, if at any time you miss any portion of the webinar or you just want to go back and see Quinn and I again, it is recorded and will be sent to you tomorrow afternoon. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar as much as we enjoy um, bringing it to you, you can also make an impact on the animals in our shelter using this link here. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat box. And without further ado, go ahead and take it away, Quinn. All righty, so I'm going to show my screen and hide my face. All righty, let's see if I can get this slideshow going. We'll just give it a second to think about what it wants to do. Hello, let's try that again. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second until I can get this working. Oop. And so well, right. Quinn is, you got it going? Um, periodically, I am going to be uh, putting some links in the chat box as Quinn talks because she does have some outside resources that are um, absolutely amazing. So that way you don't have to remember exactly what it is that she has said. So, yes, right. this could be a lot of information. <laughs> All righty, now that my, in <laughs> my uh, PowerPoint is decided to start working. Hello, my name is Quinn. I am on the behavior team here at Pasadena Humane, and I've been here for about three years. I have a CPDT certification, which basically is a fancy way of saying I am a certified dog trainer. And we are going to be here today to talk about critter enrichment. Oops. 
There we go. All right. So first, we're going to talk about what enrichment is and why it's important. And then we'll go into the specifics for different animals. So we'll talk about rabbits and guinea pigs, and then a general overview of rodents, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. But first, let's define enrichment. So on your screen, you've got this nice little poll here on uh, what do you think the definition of enrichment is? Giving lots of cuddles, which I know my cat likes, watching a good movie together, or enhancing the quality of life. Almost everyone is uh, weighed in. We're going to give it a couple more seconds. So, but Quinn, overwhelmingly, is enhancing the quality of life. Yes, exactly. So the root word of enrichment is enrich, which means to make rich or richer, especially by the addition or increase of some desirable quality, attribute, or ingredient. So how does that translate to our animals? With animals, enrichment can be defined as learning what our animals' needs are and then structuring an environment for them that allows them as much as is feasible to meet those needs. And every species and every individual animal is going to have different needs. So what might work for a macaw won't necessarily work for a mouse. And um, you can go with that for, because we're going to be talking about a lot of different critters here today. So what can enrichment do? Enrichment is a super powerful tool that can make a huge difference in an animal's physical and mental health. It gives them an outlet for species-specific behaviors that we often underestimate the need for. It increases their control over their environment and allows them to make choices. So let's say like, if I were to lock you in a bare room all day and I controlled when, what, and how much you ate, how, how much human contact you'd have, and only gave you the same one activity every single day, so maybe the same 15-piece jigsaw puzzle, you would be pretty bored, frustrated, and may start to engage in stress-related or even stereotypic behaviors, such as pacing, yelling, banging on the walls, and constantly trying to escape that room. Our pets can experience the same exact boredom, frustration, and stress, and that can be seen in behaviors like bar chewing with our rodents or feather plucking in birds and over grooming in rabbits. So providing a proper enrichment can lessen or even completely eradicate those stress behaviors because we are lowering their stress levels to a large degree. Enrichment usually falls into one or more of the following categories. So it can be environmental, cognitive, sensory, food, or toys. And we're going to go into these a little bit more in depth. So environmental enrichment is essentially manipulating multiple aspects of the animal's environment, making it as close to their natural environment as possible so they can freely engage in their species-specific behaviors. And it also is adding in novelty and complexity. So you want to look at an animal's social needs. Are they a social species or not? There's some species that really need to have a buddy or they're going to be quite depressed and very stressed. And there's other species where if you put two together, they may fight to the death. So it's really important to know the species that you have before just putting two together. We look at species specific behaviors outside of just the social norms. So do they dig or burrow? Are they arboreal? Do they like to climb? Do they fly? What kind of home building do they engage in naturally? Are they a prey or a predator species? Do they need to feel the, like feel like they can hide or do they wanna be up top where they can survey everything and find their prey item? Do they need to chew? Do they have a beak or teeth that are needing to be worn down or do they not? So every species is gonna be a little bit different. And with ad adding novelty and complexity, you also wanna keep in mind what species you have because some species it can actually add stress if you put in items that they're not familiar with. And with other species, they need that novelty and complexity to lower their stress levels. Next, we have cognitive. So this can be things like training. So you can see in the photo here, we have a zookeeper working with a, an elephant with a clicker and a stick with a ball on the end. So we call those target sticks. And what he's teaching them is to touch that target with their trunk and then he'll get a treat for that. 
And this is really helpful in zoo environments because if you need to do a medical procedure on an animal that you actually can't handle, you can teach them to touch different parts of their body to that target um, through a process called shaping, which is where you do gradual steps towards that ultimate behavior. So let's say I wanted this elephant to hold up its back left leg so that we can do some like work and just if there's any ever an injury there. So we might start by having him turn, we might just start with touch and then touch with the back leg and then slowly working towards, I can give you, I can tell you what body part I want and you can give me that body part but it's also just a fun game. With clickers, you can also teach any kind of behavior, really. It's just like with a dog or cat. Um, mental stimulation. So these can be things like food toys, having them search for their food, foraging, or things that they need to chew on. So um, if they have those teeth that are constantly growing. A big important part of enrichment is engaging the senses. So sights, do we need more new sights? Is the sight of a friend, is that gonna be helpful or not so helpful? Different sounds, playing music. So a lot of times they'll tell you with parrots to play music, so it can be really relaxing um, or playing the sounds of their natural environment for other species. Smells, give them something that smells like maybe if you had a cat, giving them something that smells like a rabbit without actually giving them the rabbit. <laughs> and things like that, letting them smell other things that might be in their environment, different flowers, just things that will still be safe for that animal. Different tastes. So instead of their regular diet, giving them something that tastes a little bit different, that's still a safe food for them to eat. And different textures. So different shaped perches for birds, or maybe we've got a sand pit and our regular bedding for a hamster, things like that. You just always wanna make sure you do your research and make sure what you are using is still safe for the animal. Then we've got our food. So of course you've got their regular diet. And this is one of those parts that's really important because if we're not getting a diet that's actually healthy for the animal, then we're, it can increase stress. So making sure they have a really natural diet. A lot of times, especially for our rodent guys, they the foods that they sell in pet stores are a lot of seeds and junk food and the things that are high in fat and it looks like a bunch of different variety so for us it's visually interesting because it looks like oh, okay i'm giving them a great variety but in reality we're giving them mcdonald's every day so making sure that you're doing your research and knowing what diet is the right one for your pet whether they need to be having fresh fruits and veggies is the pellet that you're using actually a good pellet to use? Does it have that scientific backing? All that jazz. New food items. So like this bird here, giving them something that's out of their normal diet. So it could be a walnut and they have to break through that shell. It could be a new veggie. It could be they have access to a little garden bed and they have to dig for worms or something like that. Um, which also ties into new ways to be fed. Instead of just going into that same bowl, we're gonna make them work for it. So whether that's a puzzle board or they have to forage for it or they have to pull it out of different items, things like that. And next we've got our toys. So these are often combined with our food related enrichment. So you can see in our picture there, we've got the elephant trying to get the hay out of that uh, jug container, the, the blue container thingy. And that's a great way to make him work for it as opposed to it just being in a bowl or in a pile on the ground. He actually has to stretch out that trunk and use the trunk as it might have might be used in the wild. So trying to do things where, okay, how would you actually have to get it in the wild or how can I make you figure out a puzzle to get to that food? Just like with our dogs and cats, how we like to put their food in different puzzle feeders that you can get on like chewy.com or whatever. And they're, they can be very mentally stimulating for our dogs and any other animals that we have. Novel items, things that they haven't seen before. So with birds, you can give them like a metal spoon and that can be kind of fun. You can give them some plastic cups that they can just play around with. Uh, things like that, that are gonna still be safe for your animal and making sure you are watching them if it is an item that would be harmful if ingested. And just basically things are gonna let them engage in natural behaviors. So for birds, we have a lot of preening toys where they can pull different strands apart or letting them rip things apart. It's one of those things where a lot of toys, we want them to last and last, but in reality, what they should be allowed to do is rip that toy apart. And that's huge. What your toy should look like is completely destroyed because that shows that they really needed that and they were really engaging in that item. 
And you can also make DIY toys for a lot of our species. I'm gonna throw a poll up on there. What items can you use to make DIY toys? An empty toilet paper roll and some hay, paper bags and treats, sisal rope and an egg carton. So we've got about half of the audience has voted so far. And we're gonna leave it open for just a few more seconds. And, and I'm gonna close it in three, two, and one. So Quinn, our overwhelming choice was an empty toilet paper roll in hay. In second place, we had the sisal rope and egg carton. And in third place, a paper bag and treats. So if you answered any of them, you're correct. All three are actually ones that you can use as DIY toys. It's going to depend, going to depend on what species you have and what's going to be appropriate for them. But you can get really creative with what you can use for your pets. So getting those cardboard egg cartons and stringing them in on a piece of sisal string or hemp rope and hanging it from your bird's cage so they can tear it apart or even getting those pieces of egg carton really close together and stuffing uh, foods or veggies and whatever into those little cracks so then they have to work through that, tear apart the egg carton and get to it. But if they ingest any bit of those items, it's still okay. Our toilet paper tubes, we like to make these little rattlers for our um, for our rabbits and our guinea pigs where you get the toilet paper tube, put a willow stick in there, some hay, and sometimes we'll they'll also cover it with a piece of like a paper bag and twist it so it looks like one of those like Christmas crackers and then they can tear those apart to get to the items inside. There's so many things you can do with a toilet paper tube. So if you're currently throwing them away yeah, and you have a critter, keep them. <laughs> yeah, those first uh, two choices on there, the toilet paper roll and the hay and the paper bag and treats, those are actually needed items for projects that are listed on our webpage. Yeah, so if you have those laying around, then help us out there so we can get those to, um, for those projects. Um, but pretty much just look around, what do you have around you that could be used in some kind of toy for your animal, whether you have a reptile. If you have a reptile, do you have pieces of fabric that you can make a little hammock out of? That is still a toy, that's still something that they can go on to bathe and it's a different surface on their feet. You can do things for your parrot, like we talked about with the egg cartons, for hamsters and guinea pigs and, other rodent species you can make just you can just use the tube itself and they can crawl through it if you have a chunkier friend maybe make sure to cut the uh toilet tube in half so they don't get stuck but <laughs> otherwise things like that even paper towel rolls just using those items that they can tear apart and it's okay if they do because we don't need it anyway um amazon boxes are a really good one there too because once you've taken your stuff out just remove the tape and you've got a perfectly good box if you have a species that's particularly sensitive, then you may just want to do some research on what kind of ink is used, if there's any ink on the box itself, just to make sure that that's not going to be toxic. All right, so next we're going to start heading into our species specific things and we're going to start with rabbits. Maybe. If my PowerPoint wants to proceed. There we go. All right, so rabbits 101. So their lifespan can be anywhere from seven to 10 plus years. And there is a big size difference in the species. They can be two to over 20 pounds, depending on which breed you have. If you have a dwarf rabbit, obviously they're gonna stay a little bit smaller, but if you have something like a Flemish giant, then you essentially have a dog. So there can be a huge size difference. So what size toys you need is gonna very much depend on which size rabbit you have, what is their age, what are their medical or otherwise needs. Um, a couple fun facts about rabbits, they are not a rodent, they are actually a lagomorph. The only thing they really have in common with our rodent friends is that they do still have those constantly growing teeth. They are ridiculously smart. You can teach them to do things, pretty much the same uh, things that you can teach a dog to do, that would still be appropriate for their size. So you can teach them to go and retrieve small objects, you can teach them to do tricks, you can do, a, uh, you can do rabbit agility classes. 
I had a rabbit that was how that was potty trained. So we would have a litter box out, he would go and use the litter box and would otherwise hop around the house with us. So he didn't have to be stuck in a tiny cage. Rabbits can also have OCD. So if you've ever noticed that you if you have a rabbit and you've noticed you clean the cage, and then when they go back into it, they mess everything up, they tear it apart, flip their bed over, move everything all over the place. It can be a form of OCD where we're feeling really stressed that our home isn't exactly the same as it was before. So taking a picture of what your cage looks like before and after cleaning it to make sure you're putting things in the same locations can be very helpful in lowering that uh, OCD and stress behaviors. So some species specific behaviors with rabbits, they often will come in bonded pairs or they do better with a pair when they are bonded. Some rabbits do prefer to be on their own, but for a large majority of them, they do prefer to be in a pair. And you just wanna make sure that if you are going to a shelter and you find a rabbit and they already have a bonded buddy, making sure to take them home together to make sure that neither of them are separated and start to feel depressed or anything like that. They like to dig. That's what they would be doing in the wild. They would be digging a burrow so they can hide in it. They like to chew. They need to actually because of their teeth that are constantly growing. You want to make sure that those are coming, those are wearing down evenly and they are being worn down because if they're not, if they're breaking off uneven or they're too long, they can actually develop a lot of health problems from not being able to eat properly or those teeth can start to um, cause other oral problems. They need space to run around. So keeping them just in a little tiny cage that you get at the store is really not sufficient to giving them that full space to run around. Now, right now we do have that disease going around in wild rabbit populations. So it's generally not a good idea to have them outside at the moment, just to make sure that they don't get that disease. But um, having them a good amount of space that is rabbit proofed inside is a great option, but letting them still have that safe space den, which is what we refer to with the cage. A lot of times the lack of having that safe human free space is the source of stress related behaviors. So I get a lot of rabbit clients that come to me and they say, we're having a lot of problems. Every time we try and touch him, he's running out and biting us. He, we can't, we can't touch him. We can't do this. We can't do that. And what have solved 75% of the cases is making sure that your hands are never going into that cage when the rabbit is there. So if the rabbit is in their cage, your hands don't go in. If you need to clean it, you lure them out with some treats so they can go somewhere else, you clean it, and then they can have access back to the cage once you're done so that your hands are never going in there and they're choosing to come out on their own. And you'll see a lot of problem behaviors completely dissipate, which is awesome. So enrichment, so because of that digging behavior, giving them a digging box. Now, these rabbits do look like they are outside, so that is something you probably don't wanna do right now because of that disease, but they can do a digging box where you can get either a large cardboard box or even one of those plastic swimming pools, fill it with soil or dirt or some other thing that's going to still be safe for the animal, making sure there's no pesticides or anything like that in the soil and just letting them dig and play around in that and you'll see a lot of rabbits have a ton of fun with this. You can do a bunch of different kinds of chews. So wooden chews, um, letting them, making sure that they have access to their hay 24 seven. So that, that's also gonna help wear those teeth down. Food puzzles. You can actually use the dog food puzzles for rabbits. You just wanna make sure you're watching them because most of them are made out of treated wood or they are made out of plastic, which can be harmful if they ingest anything, but letting them work through those um, can be really mentally stimulating for them. Or doing foraging where they have to forage around their whole cage or maybe around the house to find different places where there's veggies or their pellets or whatever you are using for food. Training, just like with um, pretty much any species that we're gonna be talking about, Training is a huge thing for rabbits because they are so smart. And if they're stuck in a small space, and especially when there's not too much um, new things happening, we want to get that brain nice and tired. So teaching them new tricks. I had the rabbit that I had for a while. We taught him how to spin, how to touch, jump over certain things, go grab a tissue and bring it back. We taught him to jump up, balance on his back legs, sit down, stay all that jazz, it was a lot of fun and you can get super creative and then take TikTok videos and tag us in it so we can all become TikTok famous with your funny bunny. 
Um, sensory, the same thing that we talked about earlier. So just applying to those different senses and giving them new things. You generally want to avoid giving them things that are gonna smell like a predatory animal because that can be very stressful, but different veggies that smell different, some different herbs, things like that. Um, things that are still gonna be safe for them because they do have a pretty sensitive respiratory system. All right, so next we're gonna head on to guinea pigs. So guinea pig 101, they are also known as the KV, CAVI, whichever you prefer. They can live between five and seven years and their size is a little bit more uniform. They can be up to two pounds. If your guinea pig is over two pounds, they may be overweight and they can be about eight to 10 inches long. Some fun facts, they are not a pig. They are a rodent species. They can be super duper vocal. So I'm, if you have a guinea pig, I'm sure you know all about this. If they know that you're coming with food, they are gonna come out to you with all kinds of fun noises. They'll chirp at each other. Sometimes these sounds can be telling you to go away. I can be vocalizing because I'm happy. They can be social noises that they're giving to their buddies that they're with. Um, one of those noises that we tend to hear a lot would be something along the lines of, hmm, 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 which can be I'm happy or it can be something else. It's really gonna depend if you watch the rest of their body language. Popcorning is also a really fun body language thing with our guinea pigs, where sometimes they will just jump in the air for joy because they are just so excited. Um, you can also see this in rabbits, but it's called binkying, where basically they just get so excited that they pop up in the air. The first time you see it, it can be a little bit scary because sometimes people think it's a seizure, but actually they're just really excited and they're just jumping in the air for joy. A lot of times I see this when they're getting their fresh veggies and they get super duper excited. All right, so some species specific behaviors. They are crepuscular. So you wanna keep that in mind of when you are working with them and when you are letting them sleep because they do actually often sleep with their eyes open. So sometimes we think that they're awake, but they're really just sleeping and their eyes are open. So making sure that they are actually awake before trying to engage with them and not waking them up when they should really be asleep at that time. They are very, very social and they bond for life. So it's really important for guinea pigs to not be kept separate unless they need to for a medical reason. But for the majority of them, it's going to be needing to keep them in a pair or a group. I have um, a couple, of, I have a friend in uh, Europe who actually has a huge garden set up for her 13 guinea pig herd. And they are, they have a ton of space and they are they are fixed so the there's no breeding happening but the guinea pigs are super happy because they form their little friendships within the herd but the herd itself gets along and watching them all come running for veggies is a ton of fun so making sure you have at least two and making sure when you have those guinea pigs you have a hide water and foods area for each individual and making sure the space is big enough for them because this is another species where the cages on the market are not really appropriate sizing for them, but you can DIY them for, you can DIY cages for them for a lot cheaper. They're also a prey species. So making sure they have plenty of places to hide is gonna make them feel a lot more safe. If you notice that your guinea pig is having a lot of problems with not wanting to come up and interact with you and they're constantly running away, do they have enough places to hide where your hands aren't going in, just like with our rabbits? Making sure they have plenty of different igloos and things like that so that they can run and hide when they feel the need to, but still feel safe in that hide and don't, don't see it as, oh no, the person can still come and touch me when I'm in this hide. So making sure that they feel nice and low stress. So then you're gonna have a more affiliative uh, guinea pig. I think we have a question. So this is a true false question. Um, and it's guinea pigs can be clicker trained. So, and Quinn, while we're waiting for the audience to chime in on this, we did have a question that come in, that yeah. came in. Um, and so you said that guinea pigs bond for life, um, but are they always part of, you know, bonded to another guinea pig if they weren't raised with that pig? Yes, so you can actually go through a whole bonding process with guinea pigs. If you are, if you have two guinea pigs and you're need, wanting to learn more about how to go about that bonding process, I would recommend signing up for one of our um, helpline or behavior consults 
that so then we can help you one on one. What is your living situation and how we can help you with the two little piggies that you've got and go from there. But generally they can sometimes even if they grew up together, if they were from they were siblings, let's say sometimes they're okay being together and sometimes they just get sick and tired of each other, um, especially if you have two boars that are still intact then you're likely to have a little bit more conflict, but generally with the females and as long as the males are uh, not intact and they have been neutered, then you can have a much more um, successful bonding. No, you can't guarantee that two guinea pigs are 100% gonna get along, but it's pretty, if you go through the proper bonding process, you can have a pretty um, a high level of success. All right, thank you for that. Um, and our community is weighed in as 100% true for yes. quicker training guinea pigs. Awesome. You guys are you guys are quickly catching on. They can totally be clicker trained. So all kinds of enrichment things that we can engage in with our piggies. So um, clicker training, you can trick, you can, you can train them, there we go, to do all kinds of different tricks. So not going to be necessarily as much as a dog because keep in mind they have teeny tiny legs and they can only do so much because they're so small but you can still have them push things around. Um, sometimes you can teach them to retrieve objects, but it's um, really gonna depend on your guinea pig and how affiliative they are with you. And But you can train them to do uh, guinea pig agility. If you've never seen guinea pig agility, I highly recommend looking it up on YouTube. It's gonna make your day. Nothing is more fantastic than watching a guinea pig with tiny little legs jump over a jump. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, but a big thing of enrichment is get more piggies. So if you only have one, having a second, so then they have that social interaction. Now you don't wanna go out and get 18,000 guinea pigs when you don't have the space for it, but making sure that they're also the same gender or if you have a male and a female, the male is neutered. Um, and that would be something to talk with an exotic animal vet about. Veggie foraging is a big one. So letting them search all over for their food, whether that means it's hidden all over the place or it's in a toilet paper tube or something that they have to work to get it out of that item. It can really vary on the animal or you can even use those veggies as a way to get your guinea pig to be more comfortable around you where you might sit there, put the pile of veggies near you. Once they're comfortable doing that and they stay at that veggie pile, starting to feed them from your hand, so then they learn that your hand coming towards them means I'm getting something good. So that can be a big thing. And then hides, hides, hides. So if you have the space for it, having more than one hide per guinea pig is ideal. So they have plenty of places to run and hide and make, trying to keep those hides in the same locations as much as possible so that they know exactly where they can run to as opposed to I'm scared and now I have to go find that hide. Um, and if you've got multiple, at least one per guinea pig, but anything to help lower that stress level. And now we're gonna head into kind of our overview areas. So we'll start with our rodents. So our natural behaviors for our rodents are going to differ from species to species, but all of them are going to have constantly growing teeth. That's gonna be the one thing that'll be similar for our rodents. So these might be chinchillas, ferrets, gerbils, mice, hamsters, rats, the list goes on and on of what rodents you might have depending on where you're living because I do know we have a couple of attendees who are not from the California area. So just making sure that your species is legal in your space, which most of you probably are already aware of those things if you have that species with you, but making sure to do your research on what species you have and what their needs might be. So with our rodents, the most important thing are chews because of those constantly growing teeth, just like we talked about with our rabbits and with our guinea pigs, making sure they have plenty of chews to wear down those teeth nice and evenly so nothing is, we don't have any dental problems later on. And then what are their natural behaviors? Are they a burrower? Do they prefer to climb like a mouse where they need a lot of vertical space versus a hamster where if you have too much vertical space, they are they have very poor vision. So if it goes too high, sometimes we just flop over the side because we think we're a flying squirrel. So making sure that the, the space is appropriate for your species. What kind of foods do they eat? I had a um, pet mouse named Fettuccine Alfredo and we had a whole garden. Um, it was a, essentially it was an old uh, fish tank and we connected his tubes from his huge cage to that little garden where he could, where we had chia grass and we had some mealworms in there and some millet 
and he could go and dig through the dirt to get to the bugs. He could chew on the grasses if he wanted. He could go and get the millet seeds, all kinds of things to engage in those natural behaviors. And he, we would find him pretty much daily in that space. And sometimes he would even just nap in there because he really liked that little garden space that he had that was so different from his regular cage that was nice and tall and he had things to climb on. Uh, what other sleep cycles? Are they nocturnal? Many of our rodent species are actually nocturnal. So trying to have a hamster with a small child can be a little bit difficult because the hamster is not going to be awake at the same time your child is. So it might be a better idea to get an animal that will be awake when your child is as opposed to constantly waking up that hamster when they are asleep because it's super stressful and when they don't have a full um, full night's sleep, we're going to have a cranky hamster and sometimes you're going to have some more bite incidents because we're cranky and we want to sleep and our sleep is interrupting. <laughs> so making sure that you're paying attention to their sleep cycles and respecting when they are sleeping and when they are awake. What are their social needs? So for some of our rodent species like rats, they do need to be kept in groups because they are a very social species. Mice, if you have two male mice together, they may fight to the death. Hamsters, if you have two hamsters together, they will very often fight to the death. So always try, if you're getting a hamster, always go for one, whether it is a dwarf or a Syrian hamster. With our dwarfs, I know sometimes they can be kept and they are totally fine as a pair, but the reason we have so many hamsters at our shelter right now is because often they are sent out and they are actually two different, um, they are two different genders. So they breed and they breed very, very rapidly. Hamsters go into heat every four days and they can get pregnant again after 24 hours after giving birth. So you're gonna have a ton of hamsters very quickly. So it's best just to get one and be done with that and just making sure you're giving them plenty of attention when they are awake. For enrichment, you can do garden boxes like I talked about with my mouse, or you can do digging boxes if you have a species that would like to dig. If you have things like ferrets, you can do ball pits and things like that, as long as you're watching them to make sure they're not eating the plastic balls. Climbing things with mice and rats, giving them plenty of vertical space to climb up and down because that's what they would be doing in the wild. And um, especially for our mice, we want to, instead of going for a ton of empty space and a few toys here and there, fill it to the brim with toys, making them so that they can get all over into all these little cracks and crevices, because that's where you would often find uh, mice out in the wild is when there's a lot of different things. You wouldn't necessarily find them in an open field and they're just hanging out there. You might but generally that's where they get picked up by predators. So making sure they have plenty of things to go all over and changing them out when they're getting gross, things like that. Versus if you have a hamster, they might get in, they're gonna need a lot more floor space, but giving them different surfaces instead and not as much vertical space so that we don't fall and hurt ourselves and making sure that we still have that empty space to run around, having a wheel, things like that. And something to think about is how often to change up what they have without causing extra stress. So for our hamsters, we often want to go and clean the whole cage out weekly or whatever that might be. If you have a properly sized cage, which um, often are actually not on the market for a lot of our rodent species, they, um, they're not gonna be kept as clean as long because it's such a small space. For hamsters, the minimum size that you should have is 365 square inches of floor space, which even if you looked at a lot of those have a trail or those other colorful 2B ones, they don't have that space. So if you see them chewing on the bars, that can be a big factor of my cage is too small for me, especially if you have a Syrian hamster. So going and making your own, a lot of Ikea furniture can actually be converted into cages, which is fun. So um, with hamster cages, uh, there's a lot of DIY on YouTube of how to make your own. Often they use an Ikea Detolf and um, changing that into a large hamster's cage and it's gonna give your hamster plenty of space. Um, but when you're changing out that bedding, you wanna make sure trying to only do a part at a time as opposed to the entire thing all at once because that can be very stressful. So if you can do half the cage and then the other half, that can be ideal, but it's really gonna depend on the species because for some, you're gonna need to change it out a little bit more often depending on what kind of substrate you are using. All right, 
And just like with our other species, clicker training, of course, that's not on here, but clicker training is going to apply to pretty much all of the species we are talking about today. So you can totally do clicker training with these guys. My mouse was trained to do all kinds of tricks. He would come when called. So if he had managed to get out of his cage or something like that, I could just say, Feta, come. And little Fettuccine Alfredo would come running from wherever he was in the apartment and climb up onto my shoulder and just sit there, which was pretty awesome. All right, let's jump into birds. There are so many different species of birds with a bunch of different needs. We're mostly gonna be focusing on the parrot species because that's gonna be the most common that we're gonna be seeing in the pet area. But um, this, you can take different aspects and apply them to a different species if you have a non-parrot bird. And my favorite quote by Dr. Susan Friedman, birds are built to behave, not to be still. They are not a fish tank that is made for you to sit there and watch. They are there to engage in behaviors. They are there to be with you and have that mental stimulation that they really, really need. So some species specific behaviors, there's the basics that go for all parrots, which are gonna be foraging, preening, bathing, and having a proper diet. A lot of times our pellets are not an appropriate diet. And then look at their specialization. So a homing pigeon, their GPS is oodles better than the Google G Maps. So letting them have that ability to use that GPS can be huge for them. Parrots are incredibly intelligent, especially the macaws who have the intelligence level of a three-year-old human child. So making sure you're meeting those mental needs, otherwise you're going to have a lot of stress behaviors coming out. All right, I think we have a question here. Yep, we're throwing up our last poll for this session. So environmental and cognitive enrichment are both important for birds. True or false? Oh, and let's see how smart our community is and kind of um, relating what you've already said about other species into the questions that we have because this is 100 percent a true statement quinn yes it is i love that we have all of our really smart viewers here today i feel like my critter of people are always really on top of their species because they have a, a what's technically still an exotic species it's not your typical dog or cat you've got something a little bit more specialized so avian habitat enrichment making sure they have a bunch of perches of different textures of different sizes that are still appropriate for your bird. If they only have the same exact perch all the time, they can actually develop bumblefoot, which can be super painful. Space, making sure they have as much space as you possibly can give them that is still appropriate for the species. So a lot of times I see these birds that are in these teeny tiny cages and they just get set outside during the day and then brought back in at night and they think that that's enough for the bird. But if you have a bird that's screaming and screaming and screaming constantly, it can often be a stress behavior because we are not being able to engage in those species specific behaviors. So giving them plenty of space, if you have an indoor aviary where they can actually fly, that is awesome. And we'll go into some other flight stuff in a little bit. Making sure they have uninterrupted sleep. For some of our bird species, 12 hours of uninterrupted sleep is so incredibly important to make sure that their, their bird is staying healthy, they're getting that sleep that, that they really, really need, and you're gonna have a less cranky bird. Natural sunlight is also really important for feather health and growth, especially for our younger birds, but with any of our birds, making sure they have that proper sunlight so that their feathers stay nice. And toys. So toys like we talked about earlier with preening toys, things that they can tear apart. With our birds, if you the toy is correct if you see pieces of it all over the ground. I generally try to encourage people to avoid anything with plastics or beads or things like that that can be very dangerous if ingested and going for all natural items. There is a website from birdtricks.com. I think it's birdtricksstore.com. And they have a bunch of different foraging items. And they have packages that you can get for whichever size parrot that you have. And they're gonna be all natural items. We've got the link down in the chat box there. Thank you, Michelle. And they can give you all kinds of really awesome supplies that they have there. 
Um, you've also got your forage toys. That we've talked about a lot already of just making them work for that food and edibles. So like a full blown walnut, as opposed to just the walnut that's out of the shell, <laughs> letting them work through that, uh, that shell, especially for a larger bird like macaws, it can be a great way to wear that beak down. All right, sensory. Like we talked about before, it's going to be things like music. A lot of times with our parrot species, they actually really like Rasta music, which is kind of fun because of the smooth sounds of that type of music. Nature sounds for some of our other species or even for your macaws or other parrot species as well can be super help, can be super calming. And you don't want to play it 24 seven, but something you want to play a couple hours a day, maybe a couple times a week or every single day, whichever you think your bird really prefers sight so new novel items you can see this bird here is having some supervised play with a toothbrush but maybe like making sure that you know your bird very well and knowing which kind of items they are not going to try to ingest letting them see out the windows but also keeping in mind if they are out of the cage making sure that they are aware that there's a window there so that they are not flying into the window and injuring themselves cognitive enrichment Terraining, again, you can train pretty much any species as long as they can um, engage with you and they are engaging and taking treats. For the most part, you can train them to do different tricks. So even a budgie or a parakeet, as you can see in this picture here, they can be trained to step up. They can be trained to fly to you. They can be trained to do all kinds of tricks that we think are generally reserved for our larger birds like macaws or African greys or things of that nature but you can train pretty much any bird and your higher level um, higher level intelligent birds. So the, mostly the parrot species are gonna be up there and really would lo really love engaging in that clicker training. Foraging toys, again, we talked about that again here and free flight training. Now this is a one that's gonna be very specific on the type of bird you have and their size with where you are living. If you have a small bird and you're doing free flight training that you've done through a program with a trainer that is very knowledgeable in free flight training with positive reinforcement, then you're gonna to wanna to keep that in mind because if we have a predator species there, we might kind of swoop down and your poor little budgie. So um, generally you see this more with our larger birds such as the African greys, the macaws, um, often I've seen even conures and things of that nature, but going through a program um, that you can take that free flight training course. Uh, Bird Tricks sometimes has uh, seminars and things like that on teaching free flight training, or they might have other resources in your area of where to go for free flight training if you aren't in the area where they are. But it's an awesome way to get them to use those wings and engage in natural behaviors. Lastly, we've got our reptiles and amphibians, and these guys are highly, highly specialized to their natural habitat. So every species is going to be vastly different because we see this chameleon versus a dart frog. They're going to have completely different needs. The most important thing with our reptiles and amphibians is not as it's going to be a little bit different from the other species that we've spoken about already because the best way to lower their stress is to mimic their natural habitat as much as possible. So if they're an arboreal species, giving them plenty of places to climb and hide, plenty of foliage, if you can do a bioactive enclosure, that's even better. Making sure they have the proper space for their species, making sure they have the proper diet, um, proper lighting, UVB, whatever they might need, uh, heating, if they need a cold section, humidity, uh, if you have an amphibian, water quality is a huge thing. There are some species that you can do clicker training with, with especially for our really smart species like monitors and things like that. But then there's some other species that they may not be able to hear the clicker as much or they have very poor vision and things like that. And they're a lot more difficult to train to do certain behaviors such as snakes. And so that's just something to keep in mind of what species you have, what are they capable of doing. and if they are a species that eats insects or other live things, then using that to your advantage as far as, can I get you to hunt it? Now, this is more geared toward those bug eaters. Letting them having to hunt down those bugs within their enclosure is awesome because they have to engage in those natural behaviors to catch those bugs. But if you have a snake, it's really not recommended to do live rats or mice if you can avoid it. I know sometimes we run into issues with them not wanting to eat and you have to resort to live, but you never wanna leave a 
live rat or mouse or other live prey in with a snake for very long because it actually can start harming the snake. So make sure you do a ton of research on whatever species you have, whether it's reptile or an amphibian, making sure they have the proper diet, so that they need calcium, making sure we don't end up with metabolic dope bone disease, which is super common. Just there, as long as you can get to their natural habitat as much as possible, that is the best way to provide that proper enrichment for that species. And with that, we've covered everything that we we're going to talk about. So let's go into a QA. All right, Quinn. So I there we do have a few questions here. Um so what size toy would you recommend for an Angora? An Angora. That's a good question. <laughs> hmm. Let me think. I don't see many Angoras. Oh, like an Angora rabbit. There we go. I was like, is that like a reptile? Yeah. I was like, oh wait, the breed Angora. So with the Angoras, you it's gonna depend because it's also gonna depend on the age and which line you're coming from for any of our rabbit breeds. But generally, you want to look at the toy and see, okay, is this something that my rabbit can actually toss around? If it's a little bit too big, that's okay. You generally want to go larger than too small. Because too small can be a little bit dangerous because we might ingest things that we really shouldn't. Generally, I've not, I don't see too many rabbits doing that, but you never know. There's always those special individuals that like to eat everything. And like some of our, we have a couple of dogs here that uh, will actually eat rocks. So you know, every, every animal is an individual, um, you know, so you just want to kind of judge what your rabbit's needs are from that. Yeah, so is that uh, like looking for toys, is that kind of trial and error with, you know, our critters? Because I know it's a lot of trial and error with my cat. Yes, it's totally trial and error. So if you get some toys and your rabbits or whatever species you have is just like, eh, I'm not interested in it. It can be a couple of different things. It could be a, I'm a little scared of it. It could be a, that's not really what I'm needing right now. Or it can be, I've never played with toys. I don't know what this means. So if it's the last one, teaching them how to play with it and kind of engaging in them with it. So they start to kind of play with it and pairing it with treats when they engage. Or it might be, let's try something else because I know I had a hamster that was just refused most chew items because didn't like the untreated wood blocks, didn't like the ones that were um, of different kinds of woods that are still appropriate. We didn't like a lot of things that were not working, <laughs> but we would chew on a walnut shell. He could never break through it because he was so tiny, but it worked. So we did walnut shells. Or we had um, some of the times you can, for certain species, you can use whimsies, which are a dog dental chew, but they're all natural. And for some species, they can totally use that. And that worked. So just getting creative about what your animal might be needing. What are their preferences? Do they really like fruits or do they really like their veggies? Things like that. Okay. Um, for someone interested in uh, training their rabbit to do tricks, what kind of resources do you have? That's a good question. So there's a bunch of different things on YouTube, or if you are wanting a more specific uh, training plan for you and your rabbit, you can always reach out to us. We do have critter specific BH, we call them BHL, so behavior helpline or um, behavior uh, virtual consults where we can do a consult with you over uh, Zoom and we can develop a whole training plan for you. There's not too, too many books on training certain behaviors, but Think about the dog cues that you might be teaching. You can use luring, things like that. It's going to depend on what behaviors you want to teach. But generally, there's a ton of info on the internet. As long as you go for the ones that are using treats and nothing aversive, such as just walking away, the rabbit's not doing what you want, um, you're going to be on the right track. Okay. Now, is there an age where an animal is too old? To learn, I know you know there's nope. the saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks. 
Absolutely not. So I taught our basics class here at the Humane Society with our uh, for dogs and we had dogs that were six months and I had a 13 year old in the same exact class and everyone was still learning the same material and catching on just as fast. So the only thing that might be a little bit different is if you have an animal that is blind and or deaf, then you might be looking at a little bit different kind of training that you might need to be doing. But for the most part, if they are able to be clicker trained, you are on the right track. Okay, now what about um, leash training? Uh, as I know that I, we started very young with um, our cat and taught him to walk on a leash and a harness. So are there, obviously you can't teach a bird to walk on a leash and a harness, but um, you know, what about some of the other animals that we talked about today? Yeah, so there are some species that you can. Um, I know they make ones for hamsters, but they are really, really not safe. They can actually choke the hamster. So those are not ones that I would go with, but Ooh. things like rabbits, you can totally. I'd be a little bit wary of it, especially if you're living in the California area with that disease that we have going on. But if you're not in a space oh, where yeah. there is an issue at the moment, then yes, you can totally start to work with your rabbit on leash training and using positive reinforcement training. You can, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube of how to do leash training with a rabbit and making sure that they're still comfortable watching their body language. Because if they are looking a little uncomfortable, we may need to take it back a few steps or just really reinforce being outside with, with treats, things like that. Um, some like monitors can definitely be trained to walk on a leash as well, but it's really going to depend on the size and whether or not it's appropriate for birds. The equivalent to kind of going on a walk outside would be free flight training, which again is only going to be really applicable for certain species of bird. Okay, um, and all the resources that you have mentioned, so the bird trick store, um, I've dropped that link in the chat box. I've dropped in the email address for behavior. Um, so you are welcome behavior team if you get inundated with critter questions. Yes. If you um, have and then critter, I also dropped. I was gonna say, if you have critter questions, sign up for an online consult. because You'll get contacted a lot faster than our email. Yeah. But yes. Um, and I also, so I also dropped the link to the online consults as Perfect. well in the chat box. So Quinn, thank you so much for joining us today. This was, the knowledge you have about critters just absolutely blows my mind each and every time I talk to you. <laughs> thank you. It's a lot, learned, of, a lot of random trivia facts that we know when you are in a critter world because there's so many different species. Yeah. I mean, I learn something new every time I talk to you, and then it also helps, you know, I, I jot down notes um, because then it triggers like this random question for when we're working with our kids to give them, you know, random trivia. I mean, my family already thinks that I'm nuts because I will spit off random trivia and they're like, okay, how do you even know that? Yep. I mean, I think my favorite random fact is the one about the, preg the hamster pregnancy stuff. Because people hear that yeah. and they're like, oh dear. It's like, yeah. Oh, uh. Yeah, and, and I will attest, my younger sister had hamsters and all of a sudden the cage exploded. Yep. You know, <laughs> and she had um, more than the two hamsters that were originally intended. That's why we've had so, so many hamsters lately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that everyone had a great time and learned something a little new today from Quinn. We hope that you'll join us next month as we talk about our pet preparedness and how to deal with that in natural disasters, because a lot of times we're prepared for ourselves and our kids, but not our animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.